and fight the wars that we must wage. It's all too easy to be an armchair apostle. Yeah, it is, yeah. it is. And, and to find fault with the other people, you know, and the, and the kind of, you know, say if only they did this, if only they did that, when in fact we can make a difference right now and we can prepare ourselves for the next Mass. It's the difference between my will be done and thy will be done, really. That's right, and it's the difference between earthly bread, which we don't live alone by, and this heavenly manna that comes to us in the Eucharist. Part of accepting God's will is accepting the representatives of his kingdom, the representatives he has sent us through the successor of Peter. That's right. You know, sometimes we get the leaders we deserve. We can look at past presidents, yeah. but sometimes we get popes that we don't deserve. And we can look at the 20th century popes oh. and the one who has carried us into the 21st century and thank God for a man who bears the keys of the kingdom so wisely and so generously. You know, I would also say this in closing, that we need to recognize not only does the Bible teach that the church on earth is united to heaven, but that the church is the kingdom of heaven. It isn't perfected, it isn't glorified yet, but it is really and truly the kingdom. Lumen Gentium, this document from Vatican II, taught that so clearly in chapter three, but it's something that many Catholics, I'm afraid, may have lost sight of. But if we regain it, we will also restore the vision that in the Eucharist we have the kingdom meal in the Mass. Oh my. Well, I'll look forward then to the next time I go to Mass. I'll know that I'm checking into the kingdom. Yes, indeed. And I'll look forward to next week when we'll continue our conversation discussing the Lamb's Supper, the yes. Mass, and the Apocalypse. Okay. Again, a lot of stuff to, to uh, contemplate this morning. So let me get the notes up here. Here we go. By the way, welcome to some folks that are here for the first time. It's good to have you guys. Thank you very much. And all of you, it's wonderful to be able to go through 23 weeks, 24, 25, and then we're going to start a new class. I mean, no, I'm going to do this till I die. <laughs> you may find some dusty bones in here one of those days, but I'm going to do this until, because <laughs> it's a mission, it's a calling. God wants us as adults in the Catholic faith to mature, to grow up, to understand the treasure that we have in our Catholic faith. So Scott begins this teaching and he answers Mike uh, Aquilina's question, how does the Mass advance the Kingdom of Heaven? It's a good question. How does it happen? We must understand what the Kingdom is. It's not just the reign of God over His universe. That's a given. Yes, He made the universe. How many know God's bigger than His universe? Otherwise, the universe would be God, right? Yeah. He's bigger than the universe. And so he is ruling and reigning over the universe, the, the macro universe, and the micro universe. All your cells, he's reigning over them right now. Because the Bible tells us all things are held together by Christ in a beautiful, incredible way. The essence of the kingdom is not just his reign over the universe, it is the Eucharistic, and this is what's so Catholic about it. It's the Eucharistic authority of Jesus. We get to, <laughs> how many know when you eat a beef animal, you're eating that beef animal's energy? How would you like to have the energy of Christ? Which is exactly what we receive when we receive the body and the blood. And the life is in the what? The blood. And we receive His life. His life blood every time we go to Mass. Wow. If we could capture that in our hearts and minds before we ever walk in and sit down at Mass, how many know those Masses might seem a little different? Right? They'd be packed and we would be engaged. 
We wouldn't be thinking about, man, I gotta fix that garbage disposal. That thing smells. All the other stuff that goes, right? The enemy does not want us to engage at the mass. He will try and do anything and everything. First of all, to keep you from going to the mass, but then to disengage you in some way when you're there. And we need to fight that off because our power, the power we have, the grace we have to live this Christian life comes to us through the Eucharist at the Mass. Wow. We understand that the Eucharistic authority of Jesus is the essence of His kingdom. We get to eat at the King's table in the kingdom every Mass. Scott's quotes Cardinal Journet. The kingdom of heaven is on earth. Why? Because the church on earth is in heaven. What does that mean? Somebody tell me. Give me a quick summary. Two paragraphs or more. <laughs> what does it mean? Chad, what does it mean? I'm sorry, I didn't listen to what was the question. I'm going to read it for you again. The kingdom of heaven is on earth because the church on earth is in heaven. Yep. yep. <laughs> I'm going to take that as a good answer because he is. Well, what is it? It's exactly what it is. Yep. I mean, we go to church and we're, we walk into heaven. Yes. Every time we go to church is the beautiful thing about it. Yes, ma'am. Pope Benedict XVI said, heaven is not a place, it's a person. Mm. And so... When we come into Christ, we are entering into a dimension. <laughs> you know, Jesus walked through walls after He was resurrected. Do you know that? He just appeared. Well, how many know He was in a different dimension? But wherever the king is, we can be in that dimension. And if we're at the king's table, we are eating the body and blood of Jesus at his table in his dimension. Why else would he say, we join our voices with angels? How many know it would be helpful if we could hear some of those angels? Because sometimes the singing isn't all that good. <coughs> But you know what? I think if we really tuned our hearts and perceived those angels, we could probably hear some of that. Not maybe with our physical ears, but certainly the fullness and the beauty and the, the power and majesty of the kingdom. We wouldn't be able to hear anything else. Amen. Honestly. Amen. Can you imagine what those shepherds heard from the angels when Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Myriads and myriads and myriads of angels. Glory to God in the highest. Joy to the world. Wow. She, <laughs> and nowhere in the church are we more in heaven than when she is celebrating at the Holy Mass. The book of Revelation maps out this reality. That's what's beautiful about the book. It's not about the rapture. It's not about being left behind. It's the mass. And I know people struggle with that. You have to have a Catholic perspective to really understand the book of Revelation. That's what converted Scott Hahn. He was an anti-Catholic before he listened to the Mass and was reading the book of Revelation simultaneously and all of a sudden everything clicked and it wasn't too long later he was Catholic and he wasn't tearing up his grandma's rosaries anymore. Thank God. The book of Revelation maps out this reality revealing that the liturgy of heaven is our liturgy as well. The church does not just worship like them, we worship with them. Wow. 
And we join the liturgy going on eternally in heaven at our own Eucharistic celebrations. We are advancing the kingdom of God on earth. The incense and the prayers we pray, the songs we sing, the words we say, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and the church triumphant in heaven, activates God to advance His kingdom on this earth. Mm. The Lamb of God controls our history in communion with the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes of Israel. So when you read about the 24 elders that fall down and throw their crowns on the glassy sea in front of the throne, what are they talking about? The 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, the 24 elders. And we are a kingdom of priests. And what do we sacrifice at every Mass? What does Jesus give us at every Mass? Himself. So what are we sacrificing at every Mass? We come and say, Lord, we want to live the life that Jesus is. He gave Himself for us. What are we going to do? We need to give ourselves up for the kingdom. Dean, you look like you're smiling like a chest cat. <laughs> Uh, we we went to and this is our said I had Holy Cross Thursday night and Father Michael Holy Cross was talking about the Mass and he presented this very thing in, in a bit different way at least the way I'm interpreting it is that you know when we come to Mass we bring whatever we are struggling with to that altar and, it, and if we offer it as part of that sacrifice, it becomes part of the, the sacrifice that the priest is offering. And he says that's the, the best part of the Mass to him because everybody has something different they can bring each Mass to sacrifice. And Jesus taught that principle throughout his ministry. You remember when he fed the 5,000? What did they start out with? A couple fish and and yet Jesus said, give me what you got. And then watch what I will do with it. How about the poor widow with two mites? And Jesus said, she gave more than anybody today. Two cents? She gave all she had. So when we come to Mass, we're in an environment, a dimension, where giving of ourselves Offering up our lives to God is what the Mass is all about. As we receive the body and blood that gives us the energy and strength and wisdom and grace to walk this life out. That's critically important. So we can honestly say the Mass advances the kingdom of God on earth. We pray it all the time and we made a big deal out of last week on when we pray it in the Mass. When do we praise the our, pray the Our Father? After what? After the consecration. We're in the presence of Jesus Himself. Body, blood, <coughs> soul, and divinity. And then we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth. <coughs> now how many know we probably prayed it so many times, we need to hear it new all over again. You know what I'm saying? You can just... <laughs> no, no, no. We have to engage. Those words have to be action words. They have to be living words from the very lips of Jesus. Wow. Mike points out that in earthly kingdoms, things happen by the political process. He wanted to know how do you get things done in the kingdom of God. Scott had a simple but profound answer. It's what we've been talking about. In the kingdom of God, our sincere and embracing participation in the Holy Mass accomplishes much in the kingdom of God. We ought to be busting those doors down to get out there and share our lives. How many know some lose that grace by the time they get to the parking lot? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Help us, Jesus. It needs to get all the way home. 
and then to our workplace, and then wherever we go in this city, and in the county, and in the nation. That does not mean we do not participate in the political process. We're not monks in a cave, praying all the time, separating ourselves from the world. We live in the world, but we are not of the world. Yes. The apocalypse shows, again, apocalypse always means book of Revelation. They are one and the same. So when he says the apocalypse, he's saying it shows us that our participation in the heavenly liturgy brings down the enemies of God. If you read that book of Revelation, all these dragons are getting beat up and thrown away. All the enemies of God are being vanquished. That whole book is about the overcoming grace and power of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lamb who was slain standing on the throne. Glory and honor and majesty and wisdom are yours. And he overcomes and he overcomes and he overcomes. I will tell you the devil will try and challenge you before you get to your car outside in that parking lot. And we need to walk in that overcoming grace and love and peace and joy that we just received through the body and the blood. There is not one thing that you will face in this life that Jesus will not give you the strength to overcome. Not only overcome, but be victorious. Not one. Wow. And here's where we read it. <laughs> Revelation 11. <coughs> then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. And in the book of Revelation, it used to be in the old temple. We don't have trumpets at our masses. But you know what? If you watch a high mass at a national cathedral, they will have trumpets all the time. It's a liturgical instrument. So when you read it in the book of Revelation, we're talking about the liturgy, the mass. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there was a loud voice, voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has what? Become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders, who are they again? 12 what? Tribes, Tribes. Tribes 12. Apostles. 24 elders who sit on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. This is a todah. How many remember the todah sacrifice? We talked this several weeks ago. Todah sacrifice. It's a praise and a thanksgiving that we have. That's what Eucharist means, thanksgiving. And it includes our praises as well. Thanking God for delivering our families out of all kinds of problems, obstacles, difficulties that happen in this life. Jackie and I know exactly what this is all about because she lost her husband two months before I lost my wife at 38 years old. How many know that wasn't on my day planner? I wasn't expecting that. I did not see that as a plan in my life. But it wasn't two and a half years later. Miss Jackie, who's lost her husband, she's in ashes. We're in ashes. I got two little kids. And that incredible lady came into our lives and God began to heal. In a beautiful, beautiful way. And you know what? Jackie and I do a lot of toda stuff around the house these days. Because we're thankful. I mean, thank you for praying for our plumbing over the holidays. Those things flush just beautifully. And thank God we had six kids. Could have gone awry. How I many know that it could have gone sideways? But it did not. Although we are finding Cheerios where Cheerios had never been before. <laughs> And I still have that precious thing. <laughs> I shared this last week. I'm going to do something with that video. Our four-year-old, Shep Shep, Shepherd, he hates his hair wet. So we were freaking out when he was going to be baptized 
in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I, he's going to freak. And third one, in the, in the name of the Holy Spirit, I baptize you. And he went, hey, that was great. <laughs> I'm going to get that video out on YouTube somehow. Because it was exactly opposite of what we thought. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Even though our truth, I'm down here in the middle now, right by Todal. Even though our true citizenship is in heaven, the mass makes us better citizens on this earth. Listen to me. You are pilgrims. Don't get too cozy here. This is not your final resting place. We are traveling through. But because of the mass, we're better citizens as we journey through this earth. The last words we hear from the priest at the mass, go in peace, the mass has ended. What's he really saying? Go live your Eucharistic life out in that dark world and let your light shine bright in the dark. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. That ought to just ring in our hearts as we're leaving the Mass. Go shine, go shine in the dark. Scott makes a very make a very good point that we must not isolate ourselves from the world, as some have, hanging on by their fingernails till Jesus comes to take us away. No, no, we are to occupy, take back territory for the kingdom of God. We are to occupy this foreign land as a kingdom of priests, offering our lives as living sacrifice to change the world for the better. <coughs> it reminds me of this passage in St. Luke's Gospel. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us and for all? And the Lord said, when? Who then is faithful and a wise servant, whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is the servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him serving. That's what it says. Doing so. Serving. We have been created as servants of God. And we need to serve. Jesus said, I have not come to lord over you. I have come to serve. And he stripped to the waist of the Last Supper. And what did he do? Washed their feet. And Peter was broken. Because Messiah washed my feet. And Jesus said, you've been arguing coming into this dinner on who's the greatest among you. You've never understood anything I've said for three and a half years. This is love. Peter, I wash your feet. No, no, Jesus, you can't wash my feet. Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you got no place in the kingdom. And Peter always goes the opposite opposite extreme wash all of me Jesus <laughs> no Peter I just need to wash your feet servant leadership I love that picture how do we lead by serving by example blessed is that servant who the, his master when he comes will find him so doing Truly I tell you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the men servants and the main servants and eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant, listen to me guys, this is where the Protestants are beginning to understand and I began to understand once saved, always saved is a lie. You can lose your salvation. Don't want to hear that, but it's the truth. 
There will come a day when he does not expect him at an hour he does not know and will punish him and put him with the unfaithful. So if Jesus walked in today and stared us all in the eyes, first of all, I'm sure we'd all hit our faces, number one. But I might hear him say, you know what, guys, I wrote a book. Did you know I wrote a book? It's a bestseller for a long time. Took us about 400 years to... Have you read my book? Have you followed my words? Have you figured out your destiny? And are you living it out? We need to hear this, guys. We need to be challenged in this way. I told you it was going to be tough love today. Here's the parable that puts things in perspective. Here's the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in his heart. That is what's sown along the path. And for what was sown on rocky ground, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. And yet, it has no root in himself. <clears throat> but he endures for a while, and when the tribulation or the persecution arises in account of the word, immediately he falls away. And for what was sown among thorns, this is he who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the delight of riches choke the word out, and it proves unfruitful. And for that which was sown on good soil, this is he who hears the word and understands it, and he indeed bears fruit, and he yields. In one case, a hundredfold. In another case, sixtyfold. In another case, thirtyfold. How many know we don't ever want to be negative fold? Yeah. Right? <coughs> This could be the, call, the parable of the soils. The first soil has not been prepared at all for growing fruit. Instead, it's a well-worn path packed down over time by many disappointments that the world brings into our lives. Pagans coming off the street of Rome were hard and their hearts were callous. They were beaten and bruised by the world that they had lived in. Most of them were long-term projects coming into the church. They may have heard someone sharing the kingdom of Jesus and the good news of the gospel, but so often the enemy came and stole the word like the birds on that path from their hearts so they would not understand. Many times it took a miracle of Jesus or a miracle of the apostles to bring them into the church and to shock them out of the darkness that they were living in. That's not any of you guys. You're here. But the other soils begin to apply. The next soil is rocky soil. The seed sprouts and springs to life. We embrace the joy of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. And if we don't allow God to remove the rocks from our soil and a little compost, hello. The roots of, that have sprouted will not go down deep. And when temptations and trials of this life come, our shallow roots can be blown out of the ground. And everyone in this room knows that there are events that will come. It's just a matter of time. We need to be rooted deep in our life with Jesus and hang on tight to Him. The next soil is tragically a good soil. It's great soil, but it's left unattended and thorns begin to take over. Think of someone who tries to live their life with one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in the world. And you and I know that will 
not work over time. The cares of this life, the riches of the world, choke the very life of Jesus out of them. How many talented entertainers were raised as kids in the church? They had a solid foundation. They were in good soil. And yet their ambition drove them deep into the world, offering fame and fortune only to see many of them die young. Dean. Well, I really can't help myself but think uh, in my life, in the faith, I have roots, but they really weren't very deep for a long time. And then, uh, I guess my turning point to make make me want to grow my roots deeper was going to a cursio. And yeah, I was, I was a good Catholic and, and all that, but my roots weren't getting any deeper. They were just kind of laying there, and at any time they might have been good <coughs> down. I don't know. That's that's just how. Well, how many how many friends, family do you know that have left the church, and they were they were living in soil, but there were rocks in the soil. Their their roots never got deep. Never got deep. And they're not here. And then, like I say, there have been so many. It seems to ha happen to singers and, you know, bands, rock bands. And Bruce Springsteen, You just name them over and over and over and over. And the devil just popped them in the mouth and choked them. Thorn. Thorn. And they didn't see them as thorns. They had no idea they were slowly being choked to death. Thank you, Don. God is calling us to live our lives in rich, bountiful soil that allows the root of the kingdom to go down deep and anchor us from everything the world can throw at us. We need to let our loving Father remove the rocks from our soil and add in some good compost along the way. We need to be single-minded about our vision and goal and the true meaning of this life journey we're on. Then when we hear the living words of Jesus and the teaching of the Mother Church, then we're not only going to hear them clearly, we will understand and what He's calling us to do, and then we'll go out and do it. I have a comedic friend He's not my personal friend, but I know him from Nebraska, and he's famous for saying, get her done. In fact, the back of the teacher says, got her did. Think about that for a while. He's the one that was made her in the, in the Cars series of movies. Larry the Cable Guy. Get her done. Now, this last passage is one more big trap. And we're not talking about soils now. We're talking about wheat and tares. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sleeping, well, men were sleeping, that's an interesting phrase, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, and when the weeds appeared also, and the servant of the household came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in the field? Then how has it weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? And he said, No. Lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them, and burn them. But gather the wheat into the barn. Now, Catholics, Who? what are we talking about here? Who's gathered first? The weeds. At the, at the end of the age. That's the key. Who's left behind? Who's left behind. That's exactly right. The good wheat, which is exactly what the Left Behind series was all about. But that's another story. What is that saying to you right now? We're going to finish the class with this. 
What, first of all, what is the wheat? You and I. Hopefully. The faithful. The ones that are doing it right. The ones that are rooted down deep and getting deeper by the day. The ones that are going to Mass and they're engaged. And they're receiving the living body and blood of Jesus. Soul and divinity. They're the ones that take the missionary words at the end of Mass. Go and serve the Lord. The Mass is ended. That's the wheat. Okay, who's the tares? Just the opposite. They are not of the kingdom, and yet they're in the church. Now here's the deal. How many know that Jesus was pretty clear when He said, Judge not that you be not judged. We may think we figured out who a Terry is sitting down there at the end of the pew. He can't get it right ever. He doesn't sing. He doesn't pray. Guess what? That is none of your business. Just none of my business. Tear, Pardon me? It just made you become the tear. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. See, we've got to let God have... And listen to this church though. I knew the Catholic Church wasn't perfect when I came into it. Because I came into it. <laughs> and I came in imperfect. Right? So there are imperfections. Now, the church triumphant in heaven? Perfect. The church militant on earth? We're struggling. And we've got this terrible scandal that's been going on for way, way too long. And we've not dealt with it very well at all. But it's the church. And we are that church. And I think we can maybe love some of these tares into becoming wheat if we care to try. Right? Dean. I guess the thought that, that hit me right when we started talking about this was kind of the scandal thing. And then I, as I continue to think about it, Pope Francis is really taking this, this this approach of the the weeds and he's he's saying you know don't go off the deep end and pull all the weeds we need to pray our way through this and and see where where god takes us through it that's 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 my impression of bishop that. Barron does a beautiful job of comparing the catholic church to something as beautiful as playing baseball perfectly. But he said, you know what, when you got a little kid and you want him to get excited about baseball, you don't get out the rules and say, read this, see what you think. You don't lead with the law, you lead with the love of the game. <coughs> and eventually if a kid falls in love with baseball, he's going to, well, how does this work? How can I get really good at this? Because I love this game. And he's saying Pope Francis leads with mercy, leads with love. Yes, you've got to get to law at some point. No doubt. Right? But we need to lead with mercy. Lead with love. In a beautiful, beautiful way. Powerful stuff. So, I found this note in uh, my... Uh, study Bible. Scott Hans put a study Bible together, New Testament. And they're talking about this false... I'll show you this picture here. This, that's actually rye, but there was also another uh, grassy kind of uh, growth that they called darnel. So it says, so weeds were probably darnel, a slightly poisonous plant resembling the wheat in the early stages of growth. But we have another word for it in Kansas. What do we call it? Cheat. cheat. Isn't that interesting that we call it cheat? <laughs> so what are we asking God to do? What do we want our lives to look like? That. Lord Jesus. 
Make our lives bountiful. Take out the rocky soil. Don't let any thorns. Lord, we'll pull them out. Show us how to pull them out. Make our soil rich and bountiful. Let the roots go down deep and anchor us. Don't you love wheat fields when you see them just like that? They're just beautiful. What else went through your heart today? What were you thinking? Elaine, what was going through your heart today? Exactly. And we get the power to remove those stones at the Mass. At the Mass. That's how the kingdom advances because if we remove the stones from our own lives, how much more effective are we going to be out there sharing the good news of the gospel? Because our roots are going deep and we're getting closer to Jesus every day and we're, we're really beginning to look like Him in everything that we do. Beautiful. Yes, ma'am. I was thinking about, um, you know, paying attention to what's going on around us at Mass and focusing on that. And at the beginning of Mass, there's uh, a part where uh, during the... Um, the, the penitent uh, prayer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Where we ask our uh, brothers and sisters to pray for me to the Lord, to the Lord, our, Lord God. our God and um, I just think it would be good to really take that to heart oh man and um, because we really need to be united and um, yeah I just the words, the word, every word in that mass is important. The these and the ands and the so ons are all important to the mass. And I would challenge all of us. Next time you go to mass, and if you're going today, try and seize all your thoughts and focus them on the mass. Don't let them stray. One time. Now, I know when there's a dirty diaper sitting by you, that's tough. I understand that. But that's also part of the kingdom, guys. Right? Father Mullen used to say, don't worry about the babies crying in Mass. Don't take them out. It's the only way they know how to pray to God. It is the only way they know how to pray to God. Now, why they pray at the top of their lungs, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. I will tell you this that after having Chrissy six kids and some other folks in our house, you know what it sounds like now? A tomb. <laughs> the life, the life, I mean, I would walk in during holidays and everything was moving. Everywhere I looked, there was something moving. And even our tree, which was supposed to be stationary was spinning <laughs> as little kids went around the back of it. It was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Yes. We just moved and we have our empty house waiting for the renters to come in. And um, my granddaughter and I went over there and I said, it's strange, isn't it? Because there's no life here. And I said, you know what, Carolyn? Um, that's life when we die and our soul the soul is gone. And this house that had the life in it is just a structure. And that's what our bodies are to hold that structure. And yet when we do die, our body or our soul and our spirits yearn to have that body back and be reunited with it. Because you are body, soul, and spirit. You can't separate the two. And yet for a period of time in death, there is a separation. And that's a sad thing. We feel that. There's a grief over that. That that body that carried that incredible person and, and really served them well for all those years is now silent and now in a waiting mode for the resurrection. 
Isn't that amazing? I tell you, I love the Mass. I love the Mass. It's so beautiful, so powerful. And we connect. The only other time I've really felt anything like what I do in the Mass is the, the night that, that Connie Kay passed. 38 years old, for the several days before the end of her life, people would come in and they were trying to cheer her up and she'd grab them by the collar and pull them down and say, love Jesus as hard as you can and she can't go. And they went out in tears encouraged by her because she was fighting. She was a fighter. I remember the week before she passed, he said, I want to go see mom and dad. And I thought, do you have any idea what that's going to mean? She was on oxygen. We had all this stuff that we had to gather together. She said, I want to see mom. Yes, ma'am. We're going. It took her 15 minutes to get up two stairs at their house. Fighting. The force of life. And I was laying in the bed by her. And she was getting very shallow breaths, and then I felt the last one. And suddenly, it seemed like that bedroom was full of angels crowding in. And I have not felt that since then until I went to Mass. And there it was again. And Connie was in that cloud of witness. What we have is a treasure. A treasure. Praise God. Yes. I think everything was good today, but I really like the way you explained the, the meat and what we get from, from that and that energy. And and, and we don't eat the flesh of Jesus on the cross. He re, you, no, we're not eating dying flesh. We're eating resurrected flesh. Resurrected flesh. Risen from the dead. Flesh and blood. Praise God. Okay, wait till the next, last two weeks. So Y'all, you better strap it in because it's going to get real interesting around here in the last two weeks. I've been listening to how he's teaching it, and I thought, whoa, what a way to go out. Hallelujah. So it's going to be good. Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. As you're going through your presentation, this song kept going through my head over and over again. The storm will shake my inmost calm into the rock I call. Yes. 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 Praise God. This church is built on the rock. Peter was that rock. And we've had some poopy popes. How many know that? <laughs> right? No, they're not. The ones are all perfect. But thank God. And the ones we had in the last century, John Paul II, when he did this series, John Paul II was still Pope. But Benedict was amazing. Saint, or, uh, Pope Francis has a lot to teach the church coming from a ghetto kind of an environment. I mean, it, he loves the poor. And people are uncomfortable with that sometimes. He sees them as a gift to the church. Wow. Love you guys. Yes, one more thing. Well, I just have a question. Protestants who um, don't believe in works, what, and, and I, I don't know, um, what do they think the judgment is going to be about? Have them read James. <laughs> what? Have them read they James. haven't read James. Yeah, yeah. what they've really... <laughs> They've really ignored so much, like the one we have today. The master's going to come back, and if you're not doing the stuff, guess what? Yeah, they just, they've got Protestant glasses on. I got a pair at home if you'd like to see what they say. <laughs> you had them on, praise God. I traded mine in. <laughs> Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord God, I am so thankful for the treasure of the Mass. The beauty of the Mass. The power and majesty and life. 
of the Mass. Lord God, make our soil rich and let the roots of your kingdom go deep down and anchor us. And we thank you for it. And we praise you for it. As we pray, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Y'all are awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.